Hello and welcome to one of our vlogs from St. Matt uh, Mark's Episcopal in Dalton, Georgia. And especially those joining us on Facebook and YouTube, we appreciate some of your responses. Uh, last week we had a video or vlog called Priorities, in which we talked about how uh, we today in the church are uh, tempted like they were in the uh, Acts of the Apostles in the beginning of the church to spend a lot of time arguing and discussing doctrine and dogma instead of actually doing the the pastoral ministries that Jesus uh, asked us to do to love God and to love others and what we could learn from that. Well, I was going to move on to a different subject this week. There are a lot of things to talk about, but there was an article in the religious uh, news service uh, this past week that I felt I, I really wanted to share with you. So uh, please bear with me on that. This, this story is about uh, a Catholic priest in Italy. His name is Andrea Conoscia. And Andrea Conoscia is a, I said, a Catholic priest at the Church of the Immaculate Virgin Mary in a very small town on the beach, about 20 miles uh, from Rome. And the town is, is Torbanica. Anica. Uh, Torba Anika, never heard of it, but it's just, it's not a very significant town. There are not a lot of tourists there. It is mostly known for the mafia kind of controlling the town, a lot of crime there. It is known for sex trafficking. There's a lot of um, uh, prostitution that goes on in this town, unfortunately. It's also known as a uh, haven for drugs, a lot of drug use, and a lot of drug selling. So it's not a very um, attractive town to talk about, but this is where this priest is. And there's a, there is a Catholic church there that, uh, he runs, but it's a very old Catholic church, and most of the members are older women who go to the church, not a lot of new people. Well, uh, he has his problems, like just about all priests do, but uh, particularly during the pandemic. And remember the pandemic started in the winter of uh, 2019, 2020. Italy was really hit hard, a lot harder than the United States, and they really had to shut down a lot of Italy. In fact, they had a... Uh, 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 mandated all the churches be closed. So Father Kenosha that was in that situation, he really couldn't do much. Uh, but also the sex workers in this city were really hit hard because obviously uh, people were not going out, so they lost their, their customers. Uh, frankly, it's their means of living. A lot of them had HIV, so they had uh, health issues to go along with a possible pandemic. And, and they were a lot of them were immigrants, so they could not be part of the, the national health care system. So they really were left out uh, of everything altogether. And when they went to ask for help from different agencies and churches, they were turned away. And a lot of this group are uh, transsexual uh, women, people who have changed their sex to become women and are part of this business. So they were really suffering. And a particular one from South America um, named Claudia uh, Salas, uh, went to, uh, finally went to his church and met uh, the Reverend Kadoshia, and, um, and he helped her. He, felt, he gave her food. He helped her to get some medical attention. He found her, eventually found her a place to live and, and a, a job as a housekeeper. So he helped her out. Well, she spread the words to others in her situation, other people who were transsexual, um, had become women and were sex workers, about here's was somebody who did not judge. This is somebody who would, not, who would help and would not turn them away. Where things went on for a while, he helped several people. And finally, he was moved once uh, morning because he had mass at his church just for the nuns who lived there. And he could not open it up because that was forbidden because of the pandemic. But he noticed that out in the plaza in front of the church, all these people were lined up every day as if they were going to attend church. So he defied the orders and he opened up the church and let people in and gave mass to the people, uh, even though it put himself in exposure for the pandemic and also his elderly mother who he took care of. So it's a, a brave, selfless thing to do. But when he did open the doors, the first day, three uh, trans women came in to the, uh, join the service. The next day, there was four. The next day, there was eight. And pretty soon, a large number of trans women were attending his church. Well, he took up that ministry and helped them to find, get health care, helped them to get food, a place to live, sometimes jobs, wherever he could, trying to help them. Well, in April of, of 2020, when he was doing this ministry with these ladies, he was just so taken by their stories that he suggested to help themselves. They, they write letters to Pope Francis in Rome at the Vatican and explain what their plight was, explain what their life was like. So they did, and lo and behold, uh, Saint, uh, Pope Francis uh, responded. He sent, um, uh, Pope Francis has a little bit of history on this subject with the, 
the LBGTQ uh, population. Uh, back when he first became Pope back in 2013, um, somebody asked him about the issue and he made the statement, who am I to judge? And then later on, he met with uh, a Jesuit priest from America named James Martin, who has a ministry for LGBTQ uh, Catholics. And it was very controversial, but Pope Francis met with him. And also last year, there was a situation in the Vatican with the Vatican Office of um, Doctrine uh, issued a statement calling that blessing of same-sex marriages is a sin. Anyone who blesses was committing a sin. Well, so Pope Francis did not agree with that. He overhauled the agency and removed those who were responsible for that decision. So he has a little bit of history here. So when he heard about this, he... Uh, now, now, understand, Pope Francis has not changed the teachings of the church. He's not changed what the doctrine is. But like we talked about last week, he, has changed, he is trying to change the priority and change the way the church treats people. So Francis sent money to um, uh, this uh, Father Canascio and uh, now tried to help out the situation. But he went a step further. In Easter of 2021, he sent an invitation to Father Canascio asking him to send some of these to come and bring with him many of these people to visit the Vatican. And once there to receive the vaccination for uh, COVID-19 and also other medical care. Well, lo and behold, he was sort of surprised because Father Canoscio showed up with two busloads of people who were in this condition. No one's expecting that. So the people, sort of the administrators of the Vatican, were, were shocked, and they went to the Pope Francis and said, what do we do? Pope Francis said, well, let them in. They are invited. And he said, ask them their names and ask them any questions that you need to ask. Do not ask them their sex. I think that showed great compassion in that statement. So the next day after they received the medical treatment, the vaccinations, the Pope Francis met with them. And to one who was from South America, who spoke, who spoke Spanish, Pope Francis said in Spanish to her, uh, don't worry, we are all the same, the eyes of God. Now, I wish I could tell you this a happy ending in this story, but it's not. Pope Francis received a lot of criticism for this. Father Canascio has been threatened. He is uh, in trouble with many members of his parish, with members of the town, with members of the elected officials. For some of the things he does, it's been hinted that he will lose his job because of his, his this ministry. So it's not all uh, games like that, but I think he gives an example of somebody who is not so much interested in what doctrine is and what the dogma is, but being a, a, a pastor, uh, been having a, a pastoral ministry go on. Another example I want to give is Rick Warren. And everybody's heard of Rick Warren. He is the very famous and successful and effective minister of Saddleback Church out in California. Now, Rick Warren started, he and his wife started back in 1980 with seven people who attended a Bible study in his apartment, at the Saddleback Condominium there. And it's grown in one of the, the largest churches in the country. I think it's among, I think it's six, but you know that changes probably daily. But he has been very successful, but seems to have avoided the temptation of gaining power and wealth, as many people in his situation have. He is a very effective writer. The uh, uh, you know uh, the books that he's written, and the so I read his daily devotionals and learn a great deal from them. And uh, but one story of him is just recently that his when the Southern Baptist Convention had their uh, meeting this past summer. Uh, it was uh, one of the things on the agenda was to uh, somehow punish or even kick out Saddleback Church. What they had done is they had made three women as pastors in the um, you know, conglomeration that is Saddleback Church. They have many different divisions. They had three women join the staff as pastors, and many people wanted to kick them out of the Southern Baptist Convention. Well, when they had the meeting, Rick Warren surprised everybody by showing up himself, you know, and showed up on the floor and asked to address the group and said, you know, that uh, we obviously disagree on this. He says, but the Southern Baptist Convention was founded with the idea of the of making uh, disciples of all the world, following what they call the Great Commission. And he says that we're arguing about doctrine and about issues that are secondary. And he finished up his speech by saying, are we going to keep the main thing the main thing? I think that's a good example for for us as uh, we consider ourselves this Pentecost and uh, during this time and studying the book of Acts and some of the mistakes they made is, is the church going to argue about issues and argue about uh, argue or is the church going to keep the main thing the main thing? So thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.